Uh, today's a bit of a, uh, of a unique day for us as we are going to move uh, a, kind of our sermon into a hybrid section. Uh, we, for the past several weeks, been in the seven churches of Revelation uh, before Palm Sunday and Easter. This is the sermon series, so we have two weeks left of that, and we're going to be finishing up that day. This said, that said, today we have folks being baptized today, so I'm going to, Lord willing, preach shorter than I normally would, which I know depresses you all mightily, but we wanted to make sure that we fit it in everything today. Uh, so if you're new with us, this will be a little bit of a hybrid sermon. We tend to exposit the text a bit more, but we're just doing um, uh, something a little different. So today we're going to be in Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13. The text will be on the screen, or you have your Bible, you can go there. Revelation 3, 7 through 13, the Church of Philadelphia. It says, To the angel of the Church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed for you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you've kept my name, and excuse me, you've kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are in the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they're not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, Since you have kept my command and endured patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's coming to the inhabitants of the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have heard so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. And I will write their name, write on them the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven, my God. And I will write also on them my new name. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Now, uh, let me just remind you, because it's been a few weeks since we've been in the book of Revelation. We took a break for Palm Sunday, we took a break for Easter, and then we have this week and next week left. But Jesus Christ is actually the one speaking here. He is giving words to seven churches. These are literal churches that existed in modern-day Turkey. So if you're thinking of your world map, think of modern-day Turkey. These are seven congregations, seven new bodies of Jesus Christ that existed there, and Jesus is giving them a word or a message. And it's each unique, each one is different. Jesus begins to the Church of Philadelphia, and yes, they stole that name from this one, to the Church of Philadelphia by saying that he is the colder of the keys. And he brings along this analogy to the church saying that he has fixed a door open, and what he has fixed open, no one will shut. There's been a lot of speculation over what the door that Jesus has fixed open in Revelation 3 is, Some have argued that there's a gospel opportunity that Jesus has fixed open, that this is about the opportunity to share and to evangelize, and that Jesus has fixed open a door that they can proclaim their faith. Most have argued, though, that Jesus is pointing to their access with God, that the door is open between them and the Father for them to come and that no one can shut it. And why do they think this? Well, there's a scripture in John 10. This is one of the gospels, and this is Jesus speaking. It says, Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Whoever enters through me will be saved. So this analogy is Jesus as the gate is the one that would be familiar to the church. And that's why most tend to think that it is about Jesus being the way to them interacting with God. And Jesus fixing the door open between he and the church that no one, including Satan and hardship, can shut. Jesus recognizes the church and he says, you have little strength in church. This isn't an insult to the church at Philly. It is a recognition is the truth. You have little strength, but like many of the early churches, their little strength has not resulted in them in forsaking the faith. They've held strong, even though they face persecution. Jesus has strong words for those who are just likely cultural Jews. He says they say they're Jews. They're actually of the church, the synagogue of Satan. It's a very strong text for them. Then the passage in the tone shifts. 
and Jesus makes remarks that he's cl- coming soon, and the reminder for them, I'm coming soon, so cling to the faith, and he will reestablish all things. Now, I'd like to actually break this down more, but I really don't have the time today. So what instead I'm going to do is kind of shift to some application because I want you to see a few really key points for us in the text today that I think we can apply to our life, even though they were written to the church of Philadelphia. But I think they will hit home for you and I today. And the first one is this. What God has opened, no one can shut. And what God has shut, no one can open. Bridget, you can go there. This should be a... Uh, point for this. Um, yeah, that's the text. Next one. There it is. What God has opened, no one can shut, and what God has shut, no one can open. You might be thinking, well, boy, Craig, that sounds really similar to the text you just read. I literally took it right from the text. The best preaching and the best points are like not me coming up with my own thing, but literally making the point that the text says. This is what Jesus says. What God has opened, no one's going to shut, and what God has shut, no one is going to open. This is what Jesus tells the church, and while I think it's more about them coming to know God, that he is fixed between them an open door of salvation by Christ, I do think there's a lot we can apply to our life. Because, church, God will at times give you opportunities and intend for you to walk through a door, so to speak. And friend, here's the thing. Oftentimes, they aren't in our own planning, They don't always make a whole lot of sense sometimes when God opens a door. God opens a path for you to, say, start a business, or God opens a path for you to begin a ministry or serve in such a way that you've dreamed about, or maybe God is opening a door to reestablish a relationship that you've been thinking and praying about. Whatever it is, God is superintending your ways and opening doors in front of you, and you can see this in your life. If you followed Christ for any period of time, You will know there are times. Yes, Lord. (laughs) Just making sure. Uh, If you follow Christ for any period of times, you know there are times where God has opened up opportunities in your life. And here's the thing. There are two types of Christians, and I tend to fall on the latter. The first type sees God opening a door in front of them and are like, yes, Lord. I can't wait for this opportunity. I'm so excited. I'm going in faith. I see what you're doing. I'm walking it out. And and some of you are like that, and praise God. The rest of us are like this. Oh, no. Oh, I see what you're doing, Lord. Pick someone else, please. Pick someone who has more faith. Pick someone who can do this. I'm not equipped. I have busy schedule. I please don't pick me for this challenge, this opportunity. I mean, thank you and everything, and don't like smite me, but also please don't pick me for this thing. And so what happens is the 1% are jumping out of the boat. They're walking on water. They're doing the thing. The rest of us are kind of like hoping God forgets about it. And so what we start to do when the Lord has opened a door in front of us, we start to begin to question it. We start to begin to doubt it. We start to begin to poke holes in it. We begin to think about all the ways in which the open door could go wrong. We begin to doubt all the ways in which it could not be God. Some of you have had this. You know that it's the Lord calling you, but then you think, well, this could really go wrong if I walk through this, or this could really go wrong if I walk through this, or, you know, it's probably just me thinking about this, and I'm overthinking it, and and we start to try and pull the door shut that God has opened, so to speak. You know it's him, but fear and anxiety and worry and doubt, we start to second-guess ourselves, and most of us end up staring at an open door, this opportunity, and not walking through it. And here's the truth, church. When God has opened a door, nothing in this life can shut it. We can lie to ourselves, though, because of this truth. And you'll say, yeah, but Craig, there's times where I've I've, I've kind of stuck my toe through the door. I've walked through the door a little bit, and it got really hard. Like, I, I, I kind of faced opposition, or things didn't always go the way I thought it would be. And so if God was really leading me to it, wouldn't it be easy? Wouldn't it be perfect? Wouldn't it just always work? Now, let me ask you that, because we can start to believe that lie. If God led me to it, it's always going to be perfect. But how many of you are married? How many of you have perfect marriages? Mm -hmm. (laughs) One hand. (laughs) Praise God. There's always the one percenter, right? There's always the the rest of us are like, I actually feel like God led me to my spouse. Like I'm supposed to be with this person. And there's a reason, though, that I said for better or 
or worse. There was an open door that we walked through in our marriages and we said, yes, Lord, this is my person and I'm going to build a life. But it is, all, it is not always perfect. It is not always easy. There's challenges. And we accept that in this arena that maybe God called us to something, but it's not always easy because this world is broken with sin. It's challenging. There's speed bumps. But sometimes when God opens the doors in other arenas, we say, man, if it, if it was of the Lord, it wouldn't be this hard. If it was of the Lord, it would be easier or if it's of the Lord, maybe this door is going to stay open all the time, and I'll just, I'll always have, it's, it's better if I wait and we make excuses. So church, I ask you this, what doors has God opened in your life that you're just too worried to walk through? What opportunities are you not taking because you know, you don't know what will happen or what lies ahead, so you're just making an excuse to not do it? The reason the church, uh, Jesus reminds the church of Philadelphia this is because we need reminding. Because we can convince ourselves that even though God may open it, life may shut it. But church, what God has opened, no one will shut. And it seems important that we also remember the opposite. What God has shut, nothing, no one can open. Some of you know this well because you've gone down a path and you're trying to make a way and you know it's not the path that the Lord has called you to and you're just trying to break ground that way and you know you're running away from the Lord and door after door and roadblock after roadblock keeps stumbling in your face and you know deep inside that this isn't the path for you but you're just convinced I'll break down the doors. And what is equally true, what God has opened, no one can shut. What God has shut, no man can open. And I know that the natural question will come from that of like, well, okay, Pastor Craig, you just told me when the open doors from God, it can be really tough. And you just told me when the shut doors from God, it might be really tough. How do I know what's the open door in church? I can't answer that for you. I wish I could. But you know who can? The one who opened and closed the doors. And there are times where you will have to go to him, seek him and ask him and say, Lord, is this of you? Is this of you? And I have often found that in the stillness of my spirit, you know. You know when you're trying to break out against what the Lord would have you to. You know if it's about you or yourself or your flesh, and you know if it's about serving God. What God has opened, no one can shut, and what God has shut, no one can open. What doors has the Lord opened in your life? Next, and our last point for today. In the kingdom, tiny things get big results. Tiny things get big results. Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, you have little strength. This church is likely less than 200 people, the church in Philadelphia. And yet 2,000 years later, we're discussing them this day. Tiny things can get big results in the kingdom of God. In the world's eyes, strength and might make right. The one with the bigger stick, so to speak, will win the day. And try as we might as Christians, it can be hard to kind of break this mentality. Yet littered throughout the scriptures are the reminders that God will use the weak to shame the strong. That God will use the small things of this life to do big things and get big results. That God uses ordinary men and women to do extraordinary things. Not unlike the door problem, we can tend to look at what we have to offer and we will talk ourselves out of offering it because we don't think it will make a difference. You will tell yourself, I can only do X, so what, what good is that? What good is this ministry? It can only accomplish Y. What good is my offering? It's too small. It's only Z. Yet Jesus says that the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. And we see something so small and start as a small seed and grow into something fantastic. And again, we know this in our head, but I want to give you a very practical example. About 105 years ago, there was a group in Salina that started praying for revival. And they prayed and prayed and prayed, and they decided that they were going to do a tent revival service. This is around 1916. And they prayed, and then they pooled some money, and they brought in a revival preacher, and they set up a tent, and they had a revival right here in Salina. And enough people were saved and baptized out of this revival that they started praying, maybe the Lord would have us start a new church and a new fellowship. And so they planted a church. They didn't have any property, and they didn't have a building, but they had saved people, and they had a new church, and they were all excited. So they kept worshiping in a tent, 
until they could build their church facility. And over a hundred years later, you and I sit in the outcropping of that faith. Salina first started as a tent revival service. It started with just men and women in the community praying, and as the outgrowth of that prayer, seeing people saved, and then as the outgrowth of that, saying, hey, maybe we should establish a church because now we need to disciple these people, and over a hundred years later, that entire generation is dead, yet their small faith is here today. Think about that. It would have been easy to say in that tent revival meeting, well, you know, what's God really going to do with this? What's God really going to do? Why should we bring in an evangelist? Everyone's heard the gospel. Everyone knows that, you know, that Jesus loves them. Everyone's already been saying, like, why would we do this? What's the point? Why would Isaiah host another thing in the park? Everyone knows because we don't know what our tiny thing, what big results God can yield from it. You all, if you've been impacted by Salina First in any way, and we will see five young people baptized this day, it started because in 1916, some people had a little bit of a faith and walked in what God was calling them to. And so Satan would love to talk you out of offering your tiny thing this day because he knows what it can be in a hundred years. And because he knows what it can be in a hundred years, the small mustard seed becomes the tree that even birds can nest in, Jesus says. He'd love to make sure that you don't offer it today. And we can look at what we have to offer and we can say, God, what good is it? You don't know. But in the kingdom of God, tiny things get big results. And we see in the church of Philadelphia, this tiny little church holds strong even though the persecution is around them. And for that, Jesus honors them. And for that, 2,000 years later, we're reflecting upon their faith. We're considering their way they held strong. What is your tiny seed of faith that you've been holding back because you don't think it's worth it? And how would God multiply it if you simply invested it with him?